so I was asked about uh, to talk about IPv6 in public clouds, uh, probably because I was stupid enough to talk about IPv6 10 years ago, and I'm still stupid enough to talk about public clouds. So the first thing I did was I put together this nice table, and there are only two columns in this table called AWS and Azure, and that's for a reason. Namely, according to someone who published some nice infographics that covers like 50% of the market. And the third entrant there uh, killed so many services I used in production that I can't take them seriously any longer. So sorry, there will be no mention of Google Cloud apart from one slide at the very end. If you want to build a table like that for your favorite cloud, obviously you just go and read the documentation. And after you're done with all thousand pages of it, you'll have another column with the uh, checks or the X's. And well, I did that a long time ago when I was preparing the materials for my cloud training. So I didn't have to go through all the documentation. I just opened the documentation on the right pages and rechecked what's there. So some things are very obvious and there you'll see the check mark. Some things are obviously mentioned as this does not work yet, in which case you'll see a red X. And then there are things that are not mentioned and I'm strongly suspecting they don't work over IPv6 in there, you'll see the X with a question mark. Now, this is all according to publicly available documentation as of December, 2021. Things change in public clouds faster than with your favorite networking vendor. So there might be a totally new thingy in this table in a week. And uh, AWS announces things and they are available to general public, like IPv6 only virtual networks were announced last week. Wow. And they are available now. And Azure announces something and then they say, well, it's announcement and then it will be in preview and maybe in a year you can use it. So be careful with what Azure is telling you and always check whether it's in preview or not. Even though the documentation claims it all works, uh, that's not necessarily true. So yes, most of the things work and they work mostly correctly most of the time, but there are still minor gotchas. Like for example, with AWS, you can have filters in the transit gateway. That's like their central router. And those filters are limited by the number of entries like anything in a sane public cloud. If you bring your own addresses, then obviously you can summarize. If you use their addresses, then you can't summarize and that limits the scalability of your virtual cloud networking. Obviously that's not mentioned anywhere. You learn that the hard way. So there are always things that aren't mentioned. And before you use any of this information in production, please run thorough tests on it because I can't guarantee that everything here is perfectly right and working. So briefly going through it, AWS and Azure had IPv6 support with their own address space. They're using public addresses usually. They had that for ages. Then they both added bring your own addresses, which means that you can bring your own IPv6 prefix to the cloud and then use it to number your virtual networks, in which case you can even do summarization. Uh, they both supported you know, the basic set of networking functionality like static routes, or as they call them, user-defined routes, internet access, uh, which is direct in both cases. It goes straight from the IPv6 virtual machine to the IPv6 internet. Uh, both of them were dual stack only, so there was no way to run an IPv6 only virtual network. AWS announced that last week during the reInvent, and Azure still doesn't have that. Security groups work, packet filters work, and now with Azure you even have NET64 and DNS64. So basic networking, no problems, it all works apart from minor gotchas. Um, as we go into load balancing, you'll see many more X's on the right hand side. Uh, AWS is doing pretty well. Uh, remember that network load balancing is really a scale out net. It's called load balancing, but it's really just fancy net. 
And you, they, they don't want to do NAT between protocols. So AWS can do four to four or six to six. Azure can do the same thing. Application load balancing is really uh, something like HA proxy or Nginx in AWS case, and probably a Windows server in Azure case. And then they both put the network load balancer in front of a farm of the application load balancers to scale it out. And AWS can do it on v6, and for whatever reason, Azure cannot do it on v6. I mean, I don't get it, sorry. Uh, but that's what their public documentation publicly admits. So it's not like me making this up. Web application firewall in both uh, in AWS case is a standalone product, and yes, it works over v6. In Azure, is just a plugin for the application load balancer, so obviously it cannot work over v6. Cloud front or front door, front door, this is their CDN, it all works. Cross protocol load balancing, it looks like AWS can do it now with application load balancer. So you can have V6 on the outside, V4 on the inside or vice versa or any combination. Azure obviously can't do it because they can't do this. Virtual network peering, connecting virtual networks over V4 or V6, no problem. Direct connect, so that's your direct link into a public cloud works in both cases. A VPN gateway, yet again, I have no idea why it doesn't work over in Azure, but that's what they claim. Uh, AWS, yes, you can run VPN gateway with V4 or V6 inside the tunnel, but the endpoints, the transport endpoints can be only IPv4. Then you have the transit gateway or Azure equivalent is virtual WAN. This is like the central router where you connect all your VPN gateways and direct links and virtual networks and everything else. In AWS, it works with uh, IPv6. Azure virtual WAN does not. Uh, transit gateway connect. This is the thing where you run the virtual machines in the public cloud, and then you run BGP between your virtual machine, which would be an SD-WAN appliance or a firewall or what have you, and the public cloud itself. In AWS, it works with V6, and you can have any combination, uh, dual protocol, GRE tunnel, over IPv4 underlay or over IPv6 underlay. So everything works in Azure. It doesn't. The one, the two things that don't work in either case is the private link, which is really a sort of net with load balancing between two virtual networks. Uh, both of them only do that on IPv4, and no one was brave enough as of this moment to turn on IPv6 in their managed container service. So containers in both public clouds are still on IPv4. So if we take a look at the minimum effort IPv6 deployment, which is what I told people, this is how you cheat if someone wants to have IPv6 access to your services and you just can't turn it on and you don't need the, the, the tracking of the customer IP address because as you'll see in a moment, that all goes uh, totally haywire. Uh, you have IPv6 on the outside, then you have dual stack getting to your first box, and then you immediately switch over to, well, dual stack here on the DMZ, and then you switch over to IPv4 through firewall or load balancer. And this is how we know a lot of people implemented IPv6 on the chip. It all works with uh, AWS because all the services you need are IPv6 aware. Uh, with Azure, it's like, eh, maybe if we do it with front door, then a front door is dual stack and it can support v4 and v6 targets on the back end. So yeah, we can cheat with front door and we can get this done. Uh, very similarly, if you want to have an IPv6 only network for whatever reason over here, uh, then with AWS, it's a piece of cake because they just announced uh, IPv6 only networks. So yeah, one week. And uh, then you have the load balancer on the outside and with application load balancer, they can have IPv4 on the outside, IPv6 on the inside, problem solved, you can move on. So with AWS, you can do anything you wish. With Azure, you're a little bit more limited, but still you can get it working if you really insist on getting it done. Now for some fun part. Uh, in every cloud presentation, I'm telling people that cloud networking is different. And uh, whatever you learned about Ethernet and IPv4 and IPv6, 
Forget it for a moment, because we are entering a different planet. Namely, there is no layer two in a sane public cloud. There is no broadcast, there's no multicast. Everything you have is either unicast layer three, IPv4 or IPv6, or unicast layer two, unicast Mac, and unicast IPv4 and IPv6. Also, you cannot just dream up an IPv4 or IPv6 address and use it. All addresses are assigned by the orchestration system, which means that whatever your host uses, whatever your virtual machine uses, must be first assigned through the orchestration system, and then somehow must be communicated to your host through some mechanism so that the host is configured correctly. And guess what? That mechanism is called DHCP. Within a subnet, AWS does unicast layer two forwarding. Azure doesn't do even that. So layer two information in Azure is totally ignored. So what are consequences? There is no random address assignment and there is no multicast. Now I'll pause for 10 seconds and let you think about what this means for IPv6. So no Slack, link local addresses don't work because you can't assign them through the orchestration system. No duplicate address detection. Neighbor discovery works if you are sending the messages from the right source IPv6 address. So yes, neighbor discovery works and uh, ARP proxy or ND proxy is implemented in the public cloud itself. Router solicitation doesn't work. So you have to wait for the RA to figure out what your prefix is and uh, that you have to use the HCP because uh, you cannot send RS and get an RA back. Uh, Communication between link local addresses, uh, well, it doesn't work in Azure. It might work in AWS because they do have unicast on layer two if you somehow manage to get the ND mappings into your ND table. And the only sane way to assign an IPv6 to address to a VM instance is through DHCPv6 which means that, well, obviously you can't ask for an RA, you have to silently wait till RA comes by and then you figure out from the RA that you can't use Slack, you have to use uh, DHCP for address allocation and then you send a DHCPv6 request and you get back the IPv6 address that was given to you by the orchestration system. And they can obviously block uh, Slack by just not announcing any prefix in the router advertisement. So problem solved, everything works, we're good to go. Every single public cloud that is sane and does not use layer two tricks has to use this same approach. There is no way around that, which makes it hilarious when it comes to Google because you might remember that there are certain people who don't want to add the DHCPv6 to certain operating system created by a certain company. And they invent all crazy sorts of crazy reasons why DHCPv6 is bad and why we shouldn't be using it. And they even write RFCs documenting that. And all of a sudden that same company, when they build their public cloud, they use DHCPv6 because that's the only way to go makes you think twice. Uh, by the way, they do have a very nice trick. They uh, build the addresses in the orchestration system so that every VM gets a slash 96. So the way you do it is you just insert a few zeros in the middle when you are assigning addresses. And then the first address in that range, so with dot one in the end is assigned to the VM using DHCPv6, and now you would say, well, why do we need this? That's how you build containers, because this gives you a huge range of prefixes that you can use to number containers on your Google Cloud infrastructure. So from my perspective, 
that's a really great idea because you don't have to assign individual addresses. You implicitly just give a whole prefix to a virtual machine. And that's it from my end. Now you know everything you never wanted to know about IPv6 in the public cloud. And if you have any follow-up questions, these are my coordinates and you can reach me over there. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ivan. I think this uh, this was a really good overview, something that we've been looking for for a while, um, but definitely since we had our V6 cloud workshop in, oh my gosh, two years ago or something like that. So there are a couple of comments in the chat if you, uh, if you wanna have a look. Um, yep. First is service endpoints point, end and fast changing landscape from- uh... Okay, Ed will take this offline. <laughs> I add <laughs> uh, okay. a comment on bring your own address. So uh, the way it works, at least in AWS, and I think it works very similarly in Azure, but I honestly can't remember the details. I mean, after digesting several thousand pages of documentations, things start escaping you. Uh, first, you have to register your prefix with them for their use. So you would say, well, I have this slash 48. I want you to use my slash 48 in your public cloud. And you have to do that per region because every region is advertising its own address space. You have to prove that it is your prefix, which means that you might you must have a row for that and so on and so on. So there are all sorts of safeguards in place to ensure that it really is your prefix. And then when you have your prefix registered with the cloud provider, then you can use a slash 64 from that prefix when you create a virtual network. If you don't specify a slash 64 to use from your address space, then they just take a random slash 64 from their address space. That's not how Azure works. So as you, um, they do NAT66 on the way out, they will not advertise your space for you. All right, uh, <laughs> time to do some tests. I will not argue. <laughs> yeah, so I, I tried to set this up about four or five months ago and it was after they announced the GA of the IPv6 for VNet and it was doing NAT66 on the way out and you can, delegate anything larger than a slash 118 to a VM either. So you can even like influence it yourself. So uh, was this Azure or AWS? This was Azure. Oh yeah. Oh, as I said, yeah, I have no idea how Azure works or exactly. I did, but I forgot it. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember it being, it being that bad, but yeah, thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, just on the, point you made about client IPs as well. If you have, certainly with Azure, if you have Azure front door, obviously it's HTTP and HTTPS only, but yes. it does insert a X forwarded for header. Exactly. Uh, front door or cloud front, I forgot to mention that are really HTTP proxies. Thank you for that. Uh, anything else? Uh, AWS is working hard on IPv6 enabling containers. Perfect, thank you. And yes, uh, Ed, I remember that discussion. Thank you for pointing that out. We had that discussion years ago. Uh, both of them modified the RA timers so that the RAs are sent out more often so that you don't have to wait forever to get the RA that you can't request. Uh, Okay, anything else? Uh, yeah, as for address assignment, uh, if you manage to assign the same address that was assigned to you in the orchestration system, then yes, obviously it all works. You are not bound to use DHCP to get the IPv6 address because in both cases in Azure and in uh, AWS, you have a sort of built-in HTTP server where you can do a GET request on a well-known IPv4 and now IPv6 address. And it will give you the instance information, including your own addresses. And you can use that to statically address yourself. 
Um, that works perfectly fine. Uh, obviously, it's easier if you do DHCPv6, although at least for one of them, I remember there being something in the documentation that DHCP only works for the first interface and for all the other interfaces, you have to number them yourself. All uh, right, and uh, yeah, then there's the mention that IPv6 in VPN is uh, a problem. Uh, some people have solved that with their own VPN appliance uh, and obviously you want to have two for redundancy. And uh, if you want more information, I promised to write a blog post about that like a year ago, still haven't done it, but if you send me an email, then yes, I will write that blog post and send you the first draft of it. <laughs>